Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Catherine A. Merriman, Chief Justice of Guam. Please welcome the Honorable Joshua F. Tenoria, Segundo Magalayan Guahan. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Lourdes A. Leon Guerrero, Imagahagan Guahan, escorted by Fininina Nasaguan, Magahagan Guahan, Attorney Jeff Cook. The Committee of the Whole of Emina Trentai Cinco Nasles to Tuan Guahan is called to order. I ask, ladies and gentlemen, that we please rise as we begin with the presentation of colors by the Guam National Guard. I call upon Anna Lourdes Cook to sing the national anthem and Mrs. Jamie Cook to sing the Guam hymn. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the Tanota, Kantamatu Nanyagit, 
Toru y lugar para y honra, para y gloria, a viva y es la sempara, para y honra, para y gloria, a Toru y tempu y pas para hita dan gini lang en a bendición contra peligro nan van safu ham du os protege For the recitation of Ina Pressy, will Senator Regine Bisco Lee kindly lead us? Ina Pressy, Gina ni mas takilo gina soku, imas takilum gi kura sonhu, zani mas figu, nani nasen yahu, hu ufresen maisadzu, parabai protehi, zanu defendi, i hinengi, i kutura, i lenguahi, i airi, i hanum zani tanu tamoru. Near and shock could it at two guinea as do as tata, Esti who a fit muggy hilui biblia, Zani Benderahu, I Benderan Guahan. Agang Hulu Pago, I Fanalalayan Oral History Project, Para I Bendishon.
At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I call upon the Most Reverend Michael J. Burns, Archbishop of Organia, to deliver the invocation. Please remain standing. Almighty and eternal God, you have revealed your glory to all nations. God of power and might, wisdom and justice, through you laws are enacted and judgment is decreed. Assist with your spirit of counsel and fortitude the governor of this island, that her administration may be conducted in righteousness and be eminently useful to the people of this land. May she encourage due respect for virtue and religion May she execute the laws with justice and mercy. And may the citizens of this island enjoy the blessings of sound government. And may we be preserved in union and in peace. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I call upon the Honorable Lourdes A. Leon Guerrero Imagahagan Guahan to present the State of uh, the Island Address. gentlemen and my gentleman Jeff Cook <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Josh Denorio Madam Speaker Tina Munya Barnes and members of the 35th Guam Legislature Madam Chief Justice Attorney General Levin Camacho our public auditor, Benjamin Cruz, honored guests, the Adjutant General Esther uh, Agigi, Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, members of the Diplomatic Corps, and my dear people of Guam, half a day and good evening. It is indeed my highest honor to come before you as Guam's first mega haga to report on the present situation of our government, to speak plainly and truthfully as we continue to deliver on our bold pledge to build a government that is fair, safe, compassionate, and prosperous for our people. Our island is in a period of transition, a time of change and a time of renewal. Our people need to be confident that their governor is making decisions to keep our finances stable and to prepare for the future. Our island needs to know that hope and opportunity for families and our future generations are always on our minds and that whatever conditions the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration inherited, we are moving forward charting a course with innovation, modernization, transparency, accountability, and excellence in government service. We can measure the current state of our island by how much trust people have in their leaders. We can measure the state of our island by how safe people feel in their homes, on their streets, and in their daily activities. We can measure it by how many people have access to quality, affordable health care. And we can measure the state of our island by the opportunities we create to help people improve their lives. The state of our island is what I am able to affirm today, and it is this. We are here now, and the state of our island is promising.
Lieutenant Governor Josh and I acknowledge that the first step to effective governance begins with placing the right people into the right positions and ensuring leadership that you can trust. Our cabinet members and senior staff are some of the most talented and diverse individuals committed to serving our government agencies. Beginning with our Chief of Staff, Tony Babalta, our Deputy Chief of Staff, John Jr. Calvo, our cabinet members and senior staff, please stand and be recognized. Your work is critical to the services we provide as a government, and Lieutenant Governor Josh and I are thankful you have chosen to be part of our familian gubetnu. Also, I have restored a fair increment process in order to recognize the often thankless but excellent jobs that many of our government employees perform for our people on a daily basis. Since taking office nearly 100 days ago, we assemble an effective and highly experienced fiscal discipline team to reignite fiscal responsibility and fairness with regard to the manner in which our government collects taxes. The team is led by our Chief Advisor on Fiscal Di Discipline, Bertha Duenas, and includes the Department of Revenue and Taxation Director, Daphne Shimizu, Bureau of Budget Management and Research Director, Lester Carlson, Department of Administration Director, Ed Burns, and Guam Economic Development Authority Director, Melanie Mendiola. We began a full assessment of public assets, liabilities, revenues, and operational expenses, and focused on collecting current taxes owed to GovGuam. Additionally, we are working closely with Attorney General Levin Camacho in dedicating tax attorneys to pursue uncollected taxes to the fullest extent of the law. We are also committed to allocating the resources and technology needed at revenue and tax to support this effort. I have said time and again that when everyone plays by the same set of rules and is held to the same set of standards, fairness is achieved. I want to commend Senator Joseph St. Augustine, Chair of the Legislature's Office of Finance and Budget, and Speaker Tina Munya Barnes for honoring my request to refrain from new legislation that would negatively impact our current revenue sources and affect funding for health and education. I am grateful to all the 15 senators of the 35th Guam Legislature for honoring this request. As, as stated in my inaugural address, I have ordered a daily reporting of our government's cash flow, and I continue to monitor these reports regularly. These reports aren't just numbers in front of me, they tell a story of where we are today and what we can do, expect in the days and weeks ahead. I am encouraged that recent reports signal a financial outlook that is promising. My fiscal team reports that we are currently collecting within budgeted estimates. We continue to closely monitor fluctuations, especially in the area of income tax, which has been impacted by the changes brought on by the Federal Tax Cuts Jobs Act of 2017. Part of our cash flow process includes the timely issuance of tax refunds. Up to this point, 
we have already paid out nearly $5 million in tax refunds. We will continue to issue your refunds in a timely manner because these are your taxpayer dollars. I also met with our bondholders from Standard & Poor's and Moody's and laid out our vision for the government's financial well-being. As a former banker, I spoke their language. I provided our investors with the assurances they need to continue placing their trusts and their money in our Guam investment bonds. I believe they have confidence in our commitment to fiscal discipline, and I anticipate having a strong collaborative relationship with them over the coming years. Because of our sound fiscal policies, Guam will continue to have a strong credit reputation in the capital market. Fiscal discipline will be the hallmark of our administration. In all that we do, we will always strive to be worthy stewards of the public trust people expect of their leaders. Toward this effort in our fiscal year 2020 budget proposal, we are committed to setting aside 2% of the general fund revenues, placing us on a responsible path toward eliminating our deficit and addressing the long-standing problems that have led to our cash flow challenges. This change will allow us to set aside cash reserves through deposits into the long dormant rainy day fund building up to a reserve of 10% of our general fund average spending over a three-year period. It will provide, for the first time, the building of a cash reserve for unplanned and unforeseen events. This reserve will also improve our government's credit and bond ratings for future financing of capital and infrastructure improvements. In order to fully address Gulf Guam's financial situation, we must be strong in addressing the unfunded federal mandates that create a huge hole in our pockets, including the Compacts of Free Association Act, the Earned Income Tax Credit, and Medicaid benefits. The people of the Micronesian Islands have always been united through and not separated by the Pacific Ocean. So we welcome our fellow brothers and sisters from our blue continent to our home. Yet the Compacts of Free Association Act has led to an increased demand on our local services and infrastructure and Congress has refused to cover the cost of this burden on our government. We have identified a total of $1.4 billion locally funded compact impact costs incurred from fiscal years 2004 through 2018. Our claims for the total annual amounts have been partially rejected because the federal government tells us our calculations do not meet the standards set by the U.S. General Accountability Office. In order to meet these standards, my administration is working with Governor Ige of Hawaii to be sure that the formula we utilize to report our costs is accurate and universal to both our jurisdictions. The bottom line is that we need to be smarter when working with the federal government, and that begins under my watch. <laughs> Earned income tax credit is the second largest unfunded federal mandates that we face, second only to compact impact. 
while the 50 individual states are reimbursed by the federal government for their EITC payments, Gov Guam is forced to pay out these tax reimbursements locally from a general fund. In the last 16 years, our EITC payments have increased from 11% of the total tax refunds paid to 43% of all tax reimbursements. I spoke with the Trump administration officials about this unfunded mandate while I was in Washington, D.C. And I continue to make our case with them on this issue. I also look forward to working with our Congress, congressional delegate, Mike Sinicholas, to resolve this inequity. Another unequal federally funded mandate for Guam is Medicaid. In the states, Medicaid has an open-ended financing structure. In Guam and the other U.S. territories, Medicaid is essentially a block grant with an annual ceiling. We stand to lose $61 million of these Medicaid funds that expire in September of this year. I am working closely with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Acting Secretary of the Interior David Bernhardt to not only extend this deadline, but also to have Guam be treated equitably with regard to its calculation. As I have said before, we need to be stronger and louder in our arguments to Congress for fair and equitable treatment with regard to these unfunded federal mandates. <laughs> the loss of federal funds due to procurement challenges has been an issue for our local government. My executive order reactivating the procurement policy office will provide for a more efficient process by allowing GovGuam agencies to procure goods and services in a timely and productive manner. This office will recommend changes to procurement procedures and laws. Goods and services procured with federal grant money will now be assisted by the Bureau of Statistics and Plans led by Tyrone Titano. I also look forward to working with Senator Sabina Paris committee in order to streamline and modernize our procurement process. Issuing these executive orders is just one of the ways in which our administration is already making a difference for our people and our island. Also, Lieutenant Governor Josh created a governor's task force to reform our cumbersome government permitting procedures. The Bureau of Statistics and Plans is leading the charge and will be working with other government agencies to streamline government permitting process that everyone from developers to homeowners tell us is too cumbersome. As we create a more efficient government, stabilize our finances and begin to experience savings, we then are able to dedicate these additional resources to our priorities. First among them is public safety. I recall just the day after the general election, a woman came up to me and said, you know, Lou, for the first time in a long time, I feel safe and I can sleep better at night. That encounter not only reminded me of the magnitude of this office, it said something bigger. It said that we have an awesome responsibility to ensure that our people can feel safe in their homes. They can find comfort knowing their children will be safe walking home from school. They feel safe getting into their cars after going out at the grocery store. And like that woman, our people can sleep better at night. 
In order to make our people feel safe, we must put more police officers on our streets and in our neighborhoods. The Guam Police Department, led by Chief Stephen Ignacio, is recruiting 30 additional police officer trainees for the next training cycle, and we anticipate their hires at the end of the month. During this same time, five police trainees will graduate, and as new officers, they will be assigned to neighborhood patrol, adding to the already increased police presence on our village streets. And our fiscal year 2020 budget proposal provides an additional $3 million to hire more police officers. cut the ribbon to open the new central police precinct in Sinahanya, made possible by the partnership between GPD and the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority. This $3.2 million precinct will replace the Hagatnya precinct with a modern, state-of-the-art facility. GPD, in partnership with the Guam Community College, is also on track to begin construction on a new DNA crime lab, which will assist the department in solving more crimes while providing for good paying local jobs. Part of our public safety strategy includes addressing Guam's catastrophic drought problem by stopping the importation of illegal narcotics at our ports of entry. After visiting with the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency under the direction of Ike Pareto, there was no mistaking that they need additional officers. I am pleased to report that there are 29 trainees in the 11th Customs Training Cycle, and soon those officers will be assigned to our ports, borders, and operational areas. In the coming fiscal year, we have committed $1.2 million to recruit and train an additional 50 new customs officers to tackle this scourge of our island. Our Guam Fire Department, led by Chief Dan Stone and his team, stands ready to respond to local and national emergency. GFD now has 45 newly commissioned firefighters and continue to leverage federal funding opportunities to maintain operational readiness. Shortly, we'll also see the rollout of a long-awaited paramedic program that will upgrade the medical response aspect of our emergency responders. In February, Typhoon Wutip tested our government's response capabilities, and I am very proud to say that our agencies led by acting Governor Josh Tenorio came through with flying colors. Guam Police Department officers were out in Core 1 making sure everyone and everything stayed safe and our Department of Public Works led by Jesse Garcia helped to eliminate much of the flooding that usually occurs in low-lying areas of the island. Another <laughs> contributing... Another contributing factor to the successful handling of the typhoon was that all heads of agencies involved had attended the Office of Homeland Security's training on Guam's emergency preparedness system under the leadership of Tim Uggen. At the Department, at the Department of Corrections, Director Samantha Brennan 
is working to hire 30 additional officers budgeted for in fiscal year 2019. This will greatly cut down DOC's overtime expenses and provide for a safer prison environment. DOC also budgeted for a prisoner's commissary to cut down instances of smuggling contraband into the prison and has implemented a residential substance abuse treatment program. At the Department of Youth Affairs, Director Melanie Brennan has taken a proactive approach to prevention measures where DYA staff work with at-risk youth in our communities to channel them into productive activities and keep them out of DYA. As I mentioned, public safety is a top priority of our administration, and I want to acknowledge Senator Peter Terlahi, who chairs the legislature's efforts on public safety. Your support and unwavering commitment to our law enforcement personnel and public agencies is welcome, but more importantly, very promising. As many of you know, I began my career as a nurse, and it's no surprise that providing quality health care to our people is personal to me and, quite frankly, to our administration. Some of you might know this, but I've actually maintained my certification as a registered nurse. Access to health care is a fundamental right of every individual. The Department of Public Health and Social Services is the gatekeeper of the health needs of our island. Under the leadership of Linda DeNorsi, our administration is providing the necessary resources to ensure that our people have access to a quality public health system from preventive measures like immunizations to access to regional health centers and long-term care. I also welcome the leadership of Senator Therese Terlai, who chairs the Committee on Health on these efforts. With regard to the use of marijuana for medical purposes, Public Health has established the Medical Cannabis Regulation Commission and appointed eight of its 11 members. Once full, the commission is tasked with ensuring the best and safest way to enable patients to use medical cannabis to provide relief from very debilitating medical conditions. My decision to sign Senator Clint Rangel's bill to legalize the use of cannabis was based on the best interests of our island. I want to thank the eight senators who courageously voted to pass this legislation. I believe that we have to control cannabis use here rather than having it control us. My administration is dedicated to fulfilling all the requirements needed to regulate the cannabis industry and to ensuring that laws surrounding the safe adult consumption of cannabis remains current and relevant for our island. When our only public hospital lost its accreditation, it lit a fire in me to regain what we worked so hard to attain when I was serving as a trustee of the Guam Memorial Hospital Board. I want to reassure all of you that there are hardworking medical personnel and employees who show up day in and day out at GMH now under the direction of Lillian Posadas, because they understand that their mission is a matter of life or death 
for many of our loved ones. In fact, these everyday heroes like Dr. Jolene Uggen just saved the life of Vince Ariola, our Director of Public Works. We need to recognize the thankless efforts of these men and women and ensure that they have the resources necessary to do their jobs. In the early days of our administration, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services granted the hospital's request for a rebase adjustment. What this means is that Medicare reimbursements to GMH will almost double, infusing over six million more dollars annually into GMH. This will allow our hospital to receive close to what it should receive for the cost of its services. This really is historic for our island because it is something we have been working for decades to get adjusted. As we look at the broader healthcare spectrum, the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center has made significant progress under the leadership of Therese Ariola. We continue to see that trend with the reopening of an intensive inpatient detoxification unit for the island as well as the straightening of evidence-based drug and alcohol treatment programs that service hundreds of clients each year. Additionally, I look forward to seeing the full implementation of the center's fee schedules as a way of generating additional revenue to further support its operational needs. As a community, we are measured in part by our successful economy and our prosperity, and also by how we help those with special challenges. The Guam Development Disabilities Council, under the leadership of Jermaine Alerta and Director Phyllis Leon Guerrero of the Department of Integrated Services for Individuals with Disabilities, are highlighting the societal contributions of individuals with developmental disabilities. One is Nick Claris, a 22-year-old young man hired recently at the Guam Police Department as a clerk. Nick, who is autistic, was hired under a 2002 public law which seeks to provide opportunities with persons with disability. Gulf Guam has not hired anyone under this program in years. Nick is now a productive member of the GPD staff. Evelyn, Nick's mom, is here with us tonight. Evelyn, you must be so proud of your son. I know I am. While we are working to provide employment opportunities to more residents and diversify our economy, tourism remains vital to our continued economic prosperity. Since 2016, Guam has welcomed over 1.5 million visitors each year with an average annual growth of nearly 4%. These growing arrivals support our 21,000 jobs for our island and generate nearly $2 billion in sales and $260 million in government revenue. I'm confident that through the leadership of Guam Visitors Bureau President and CEO Pilar Laguatna, Guam will continue to have unprecedented growth in the tourism industry and be the choice destination for tourists in the Asia Pacific region. As the first and last portal 
through which one million visitors and travelers enter and leave our beautiful island each year. The Antonio B. Juan Pat Guam International Airport gives our visitors their first and final impression of Guam. To enhance that impression, the airport is working toward full completion of its international arrivals corridor, as well as building a separate air terminal for inter-island air service to enhance our connectivity to our neighboring islands. I have complete confidence that under the leadership of former Senator Tom Atta, the airport team will get the job done. And I know that as chair of the committee overseeing air transporta transportation, Vice Speaker Talina Nelson will support the airport's efforts. Our economic prosperity requires a modernized commercial port that is a first class facility providing cargo handling services in a safe, efficient and sustainable manner. In order to serve as the hub of Micronesia, the port, through the leadership of General Manager Rory Respicio, is pursuing incentives to develop a fuel facility, identify a recycling enterprise zone location, build a cruise ship facility, and reprogram $7 million to address much needed repairs. For too long, the mission of the Guam Economic Development Authority has been overshadowed by its off-island efforts. Under the leadership of Melanie Mendola, Gita is renewing its mission to develop a sound and sustainable local economy through innovative programs that preserve and promote local culture, economic opportunities, and quality of life. Gita is working to diversify our island's economy through expansion of the agriculture industry by providing support and coordination with many of our farming organizations. GIDA will also soon la launch the Agriculture Accelerator Program, a program to get local produce in our public schools by 2020. GIDA's qualifying certificate program has provided economic incentives to investors to build Guam's economy over the years. I have asked Gita to look at this economic growth tool to learn from past uses while employing it to expand opportunities for our small businesses, such as the Recycling QC program. Additionally, Gita has finalized a QC Community Contribution Grant Program expected to start next fiscal year to award funds to our local nonprofit organizations and government agencies in need of assistance. Another of the ideas Lieutenant Governor Josh and I have explored to boost our economy is to bring new revenue to our island in the form of fresh, sustainable investments. Gita and my Chief Advisor on Economic Development, National and International Affairs, former Governor Carl Guterres, have carved out focus areas ranging from small businesses incubation to technological advancement. The economic redevelopment of our capital is part of that effort. Malaguzu pagu beyu sangani hamzu donkulu na ekwadismenti para estina onra itumotagihu pagu para tafan ali patafan akwentusi put half a sia bidan mami and sijaf gini gimapus na shantu dias. Bula bidan mami lo mas bula pomatoki. Pues su fafa y sin todo y sin adorar ni sin adoras, pero tafan daña 
pata fenhano mo na todo pata na lamang lik esti islata esti na lugar bula memories bula historia bula mas layman matsogwi para uman na lafamalik ini na latamona pes maila zeta fendanya zeta fenhano mo na zeta na lamang lik esti ni la lata gini gi islata this great hall fulfills the portion of the master plan of the Haganya Restoration and Redevelopment Authority, headed by Lasia Kassil and overseen by legislative chair of the Haganya Revitalization, Senator Kelly Marsh Titano. Revitalizing our culture and our Chamorro language are also tied to our economic sustainability, and for that, I am counting on the lead efforts of Anne Maria Arceo, Executive Director of the Comisión Ifino Chamorro. Because properties belonging to the government of Guam are properties that belong to the people of Guam, Gita is also collaborating with Jack Haddock from the Chamorro Land Trust, Joe Angoko from the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission, Joe Borja from the Department of Land Management and other agencies to improve the efficiency of the government leasing process. Our mayors know our villages and our village residents. The mayors are working with Gita to identify opportunity zone projects that may benefit the villages through jobs and increase economic activity. And we thank them for this very important effort. <laughs> the success of our economic future is heavily dependent on how much we invest in the education and training of our local workforce. With David Delisola at the helm of the Department of Labor, I am confident that we will have a skilled local workforce that can take advantage of the opportunities of tomorrow. The Department of Labor reports that the island's low 3.8 unemployment rate may drop even further with wage rates increasing. The Guam Registered Apprenticeship Program is a win-win for both employers and employees. This program provides significant tax incentives and savings for employers while training their employees. We encourage the legislature to renew this important legislation, which is set to expire at the end of this year. The lack of a reliable public transportation system that can get people to work or to school is a long-standing crisis for many of our residents. The Guam Regional Transit Authority now, under the direction of Sel Babalta, has already completed the specs for procurement of 10 new buses funded by the Federal Transportation Administration. GRTA is also working on a new one-call, one-click transportation management system that will greatly improve customer service and enable riders to make reservations, purchase bus passes online, or by mobile application and view the bus schedule. As I have said, positive change is coming. While our administration prioritizes building a vibrant and local workforce, a supplemental foreign skilled labor workforce continues to be instrumental to our economic growth. I am pleased that several contractors have been recently approved to bring in over 300 H-2B visa workers from the Philippines as I told the White House members of Congress, 
the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services during my trip to D.C., every project on Guam is tied to the military buildup. We are one community and we need to stand strong in forcing the federal government to recognize this fact. <laughs> the military buildup is on everyone's mind because it now has an $8.7 billion price tag. The Guam Building Office, led by Vera Taposhnia, together with my chief advisor on military and regional affairs, former Senator Leon, Carlotta Leon Guerrero, are monitoring buildup related activities to ensure a one Guam approach. We look forward to continue working with Senator Regine Bisco Lee on the buildup in her capacity as Legislative Oversight Chair of Federal Affairs. I also want to acknowledge and thank Admiral Sushana Chatfield, Commander of Joint Region Marianas, for her partnership. I am looking forward to working with her and convening the Civil Military Coordinating Council to address buildup issues. With the military buildup and the economic influx it will bring, our administration is determined to see that it be done responsibly and at a pace that will benefit and respect our local people, culture, and environment. We need to strengthen our legal capacity so that we can, for example, uphold the Endangered Species Act in order to protect our resources and our environment. Renewable energy is also on our radar and our Guam Energy Office, led by Rebecca Respicio, will head this effort. The Department of Agriculture, under the leadership of Director Chelsea Munebrek, is working with our local farmers and fishermen to create sustainable agriculture aquaculture and commercial fishery projects along with effective monitoring and conservation strategies. The department is partnering with UOG, GCC, and federal and non-governmental organizations to improve educational opportunities, vocational training, and internship in this area. There is no mistaking that the promise for our future lies in educating our children in a safe and productive learning environment. Our school safety partnership program will provide actionable steps to improve safety at our island's public schools. Lieutenant Governor Josh and Superintendent John Fernandez co-chair this partnership and our proposed budget will dedicate a half a million dollars to ensure that our children are safe in their schools. When it comes to Simon Sanchez High School, we are committed to finally moving this project forward smoothly and quickly so that students and faculty at the home of the Sharks will benefit from a new and modern educational facility. I am excited to know that the Guam Community College, under the leadership of Dr. Mary Okada, will be offering a two-year Associate of Science degree in nursing beginning this fall. And who knows, perhaps one of these soon-to-be nurses will one day become governor.
The University of Guam, with Dr. Thomas Christ at its helm, will start construction on its new School of Engineering this year. This facility will include laboratories for hydraulics, soil, and structure, and environmental engineering. Finally, we will be able to have homegrown engineers, a much needed profession to move our economy forward. Later this month, I plan on signing another executive order to create an aquaculture task force. I am optimistic that this industry, when developed, will make Guam a regional hub for fresh farm seafood. Our efforts will benefit from UOG's expertise as they will soon enter into a public-private partnership to produce resilient and sustainable food sources for both export and local consumption. We are excited the collaborative efforts that all three of our island's public education institutions have developed with each other and with our partner colleges throughout the region. I know that stable funding has been an issue over the past several years for all three educational institutions. Our administration will ensure that allotments for education are never held back that stops now because our children and teachers deserve no less. <laughs> the dream of home ownership will still eludes many of our island residents, but we are working to turning that dream into a reality. Ray Taposnia, Gura's executive director, has cut the ribbon for 130 low to moderate homes in Dedo since taking over the agency. Today, Guam now has 1,500 such units built with federal tax credits, and just last week, the Housing Authority approved the award of a contract to design a residential treatment center for women in Tijan. <laughs> Gura isn't the only agency helping families feel the pride of owning their first home. Yesterday, I joined the president of the Guam Housing Corporation, Alice Tyheron, to give more than 30 families additional help towards purchasing their first home. This was made possible thanks to the Guam Housing Corporation's First Time Home Owners Assistance Program, which pays up to $10,000 of the total cost of a home. Alice and her team at Guam Housing are doing important work to also provide low-cost rentals for those individuals and families who would otherwise not be able to afford the market. Guam Housing Corporation is also helping veterans with their VA loans and providing mortgage loans to Chamorro Land Trust owners. Recreation and exercise are important for our community's health and social worker welfare. Toward that effort, our Department of Parks and Recreation, under the direction of Richard Ibanez, has already reopened the Dededo Pool. This Saturday, I'm told, he will jump into Hagatnya Pool to officially reopen it, and I may just follow him. <laughs> There is so much promise for the state of our island, but the complete realization of what the future holds for us cannot be achieved without first determining our own destiny. Although pending litigation prevents us from setting a date to hold a plebiscite, 
It will not deter us from moving forward on an education and outreach program for our status options. I am relying on Melvin Wanpad Borja, Executive Director for the Commission on Decolonization for this task. We alone are responsible for this choice about which path Guam will pursue, whether it be statehood, free association, or independence. No one will do it for us, and I am committed to seeing this entire process through. Shortly after I took my oath as Mega Haga and Commander-in-Chief of the Guam National Guard, 71 soldiers were mobilized in support of the THAAD, which has deployed to Guam to secure and protect critical assets from bad actors in the region. Over 80 Guam Air National Guard personnel are currently deployed all over the world, and next month, over 200 of our Guam Army National Guard soldiers will deploy to Egypt on a peacekeeping mission. I want to commend the leadership of our Adjutant General, Colonel Esther Agagi, who I am proud to recognize as the first woman appointed to this top leadership position. I am confident in her ability to sustain our Guam Guard's reputation as one of the best units in the nation. We are proud and humbled by the service and sacrifices of our soldiers and airmen and women. We pray for their safe and swift return home, and we also are grateful to their families for their sacrifices and support. To the members of our military services who are no longer serving our veterans, your patriotism and love of our island and country remains unquestioned. You deserve so much better than what you have dealt with in the past. The Guam Veterans Affairs Office, led by your fellow veteran, Fred Bordalio, is working in coordination with GURA to identify land and federal requirements in order to build a brand new Veterans Center for Guam. <laughs> the Veterans Affairs Office is also completing plans to expand our Veterans Cemetery and reviewing applications for Guamanian veterans to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. Fred has also proposed the establishment of a Veterans Advisory Council, which I will act upon this month. <laughs> this year marks the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Guam. It is the time when we highlight the stories of our Manamku, the members of our island's greatest generation. During the Japanese occupation, they were interned, forced to work and march, raped, beaten, and beheaded. We must never forget the suffering that they endured or the strength and courage they exhibited in the face of such adversity. Today, despite the passage of federal legislation that recognized their suffering and will provide monetary parity, more legislation is now necessary to bring both survivors and the heirs final closure. I will support any federal legislation that will give this issue the fix that is needed. And I appreciate Senator Amanda Shelton's resolution to do the same. Still, this current situation is unfair and unacceptable to the remaining survivors of our occupation. 
Last week, I met with Interior Assistant Secretary Doug Dominich to discuss the plan to use unexpected reconciled Section 30 funding to award valid claims to living survivors under the Guam World War II Loyalty Recognition Act. Tomorrow, I will send a letter to the White House and to the Interior Secretary to expedite this plan and award these claims because I am determined to make this right as soon as possible. <laughs> I'm encouraged by my meeting with Assistant Secretary Dominich, but I know this will still take a great deal of effort. This isn't about the monetary value. No amount of money can heal the wounds from war. This is about the principle of just compensation for the people of Guam. As we prepare to honor our survivors with this year's liberation theme of peace and friendship, let us draw on the strength and resilience they exhibited during the war by being strong in our commitment to build a legacy that honors their sacrifices. I want to thank you for being here tonight. And to those joining us on TV or on social media, thank you for welcoming me into your homes or places of work as I share with you the state of our island and the promising future it holds for all of us. Each of you represents the promises of a government and an island that can be more productive and more sustainable when we move forward together. All of us must use every fiber of our being to help each other become stronger and better. We must use our resources to help us reach our goals and to lift each other up at every instance. We must listen to our inner voices and trust our instincts in every decision we make, even the most difficult ones. And most importantly, we must do all that we can possibly do using not only our physical strength, but also the strength of our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to improve our quality of life as one island. Josh and I are very humbled by the honor and opportunity to serve you. This is the state of our island and the start of a promising journey. Sidzus Masi and God bless Guam. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I call upon Pastor William Schmidt, Vice President of Guam Ministries, to deliver the benediction. Please remain standing. Had to get instruction here. <laughs> Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, when you taught us to pray, you said to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We recognize that you are holy and worthy of all praise and worship. We are looking to you tonight for your continued guidance and divine wisdom. 
Of all the things that your servant Solomon could have asked for, he chose to ask you for wisdom for his people. You promised to grant us wisdom if we ask in faith, believing you to release to us the wisdom from above. Father, you have a divine and a sovereign plan for this island. So may your kingdom come and your will be done concerning our island as it is in heaven. So let it be in this island we call Guahan because she has and has been blessed by you. May we not take your great grace that has been bestowed on her for granted. We pray for Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor Tenario, all of our elected senators, all those who have been appointed to places of responsibility and authority. And we also pray, Lord, for all of our uh, military branches that are represented here and the great responsibilities that they have to protect our island. We pray also for those who are in authority. We understand that all authority originates with you from above. We pray as we close tonight that you grant and instill in every elected official and appointed public servant a heart of a servant ready to serve you in your sovereign purpose and will for our small land mass, but oh so significant in your kingdom's plan, our Guam. We lift this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Majority Leader, Vice Speaker uh, Talina Nelson, you are recognized. Sujus Masi, Madam Speaker, I move to rise from the Committee of the Whole and to adjourn today's session subject to call of the Speaker. A motion was made to rise from the Committee of the Whole and to adjourn today's session subject to the call of the Speaker. Are there any objections? Hearing none, this legisl legislative session is adjourned subject to the call of the Speaker. <laughs>